Chapter Seven of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. Chapter Seven. Michael Cavendish, twenty twenty seven. Mike was just coming through the clump of trees when the boy began to wave at him. He shifted the clumsy old Jeffrey four seventy five, cursing the weight as he quickened his pace. But there was no help for it. He had to carry the gun himself. None of the boys were big enough. He wondered what it had been like in the old days when you could get full-sized bearers. There used to be game all over the place, too, and a white hunter was king. And what was there left now? Nothing but pygmies, all of them, scurrying around and beating the brush for dibatags and gerenics. When he was still a boy, Mike had seen the last of the big antelopes go, the last of the wildebeests and zebra, too. Then the carnivores followed the lions and the leopards. Simba was dead. And just as well. These natives would never dare to come out of the villages if they knew any lions were left. Most of them had gone to Cape and the other cities anyway. Handling cattle was too much of a chore except on a government farm. Those cows looked like moving mountains alongside the average boy. Of course there were still some of the older generation left, Kikiyu and even a few Watusi. But the free inoculations had begun many years ago, and the life cycle moved at an accelerated pace here. Natives grew old and died at thirty. They matured at fifteen. Now, with the shortage of game, the elders perished still more swiftly, and only the young remained outside the cities and the farm projects. Mike smiled as he waited for the boy to come up to him. He wasn't smiling at the boy. He was smiling at himself for being here. He ought to be in Cape, too, or Kenya Roby. Damn silly, this business of being a white hunter, when there was nothing left to hunt. But somehow he'd stayed on since Dad died. There were a few compensations. At least here in the forests, a man could still move about a bit, taste privacy and solitude, and the strange exotic tropical fruit called loneliness. Even that was vanishing today. It was compensation enough, perhaps, for lugging this damned Jeffrey. Mike tried to remember the last time he'd fired it at a living target. A year? Two years? Yes, almost two. That gorilla up in Ruwenzori country. At least the boys swore it was Ngagi. He hadn't hit it anyway. Got away in the darkness. Probably he'd been shooting at a shadow. There were no more gorillas. Maybe they'd been taking the shots, too. Perhaps they'd all turned into rhesus monkeys. Mike watched the boy run towards him. It was a good five hundred yards from the river bank, and the short brown legs couldn't move very swiftly. He wondered what it felt like to be small. One's sense of proportion must be different, and that in turn would affect one's sense of values. What values applied to the world about you when you were only three feet high? Mike wouldn't know. He was a big man, almost five feet seven. Sometimes Mike reflected on what things might be like if he'd been born, say, twenty years later. By that time almost everyone would be a product of left shots, and he'd be no exception. He might stay with people his own age in Kenya Roby without feeling self-conscious, clumsy, conspicuous. Pressed, he had to admit that was part of the reason he preferred to remain out here at Dad's old place. He could tolerate the stares of the natives, but whenever he ventured into a city he felt awkward under the scrutiny of the young people. The way those teenagers looked up at him made him feel a monster, rather. Better to endure the monotony, the emptiness out here, yes, and wait for a chance to hunt, even though nine times out of ten it turned out to be a wild goose chase. During the past year or so, Mike had hunted nothing but legends and rumors, spent his time stalking shadows. Then the villagers had come to him three days ago with their wild story. Even when he heard it, he realized it must be pure fable, and the more they insisted, the more they protested, the more he realized it simply couldn't be. Still, he'd come, anything to experience some action, anything to create the illusion of purpose, of Tembo! shrieked the boy, excited beyond all pretense of caution. Up ahead, in the river. You come quick, you see. No, it couldn't be. The government surveys were thorough. The last record of a specimen dated back over a half dozen years ago. It was impossible that any survivors remained, and all during the safari these past days, not a sign or a print or a spore. Tembo! shrilled the boy. Come quick! Mike cradled the gun and started forward. The other bearers shuffled behind him, unable to keep pace because of their short legs, and he suspected unwilling to do so for fear of what might lie ahead. Halfway towards the river bank, Mike halted. Now he could hear the rumbling, 
the unmistakable rumbling, and now he could smell the rank mustiness borne on the hot breeze. Well, at least he was downwind. The boy behind him trembled, eyes wide. He had seen something, all right. Maybe just a crocodile, though. Still some crocs around, and he doubted if any young native would know the difference. Nevertheless, Mike felt a sudden urge of unfamiliar excitement, half expectancy and half fear. Something wallowed in the river, something that rumbled and exuded the stench of life. Now they were approaching the trees bordering the bank. Mike checked his gun carefully. Then he advanced until his body was aligned with the trees. From here he could see and not be seen. He could peer down at the river, or the place where the river had been during the rainy season long past. Now it was nothing but a mud wallow under the glaring sun, a huge mud wallow pitted with deep circular indentations and dotted with dung. But in the middle of it stood Tembo. Tembo was a mountain. Tembo was a black block of breathing basalt. Tembo roared and snorted and rolled red eyes. Mike gasped. He was a white hunter, but he'd never seen a bull elephant before, and this one stood eleven feet at the shoulders if it stood an inch, the biggest creature walking the face of the earth. It had risen from the mud, abandoned its wallowing as its trunk curled about, sensitive to the unfamiliar scent of man. Its ears rose like the outspread wings of some gigantic jungle bat. Mike could see the flies buzzing around the ragged edges. He stared at the great tusks that were veined and yellowed and broken. Once men had hunted elephants for ivory, he remembered. But how could they? Even with guns, how had they dared to confront a moving mountain? Mike tried to swallow, but his throat was dry. The stock slipped through his clammy hands. Shoot, implored the boy beside him. You shoot now! Mike gazed down. The elephant was aware of him. It turned deliberately, staring up the bank as it swayed on the four black pillars of its legs. Mike could see its eyes set in a mass of grayish wrinkles. The eyes had recognized him. They knew, he realized. The eyes knew all about him, who he was and what he was and what he had come here to do. The eyes had seen man before, perhaps long before Mike was born. They understood everything, the gun and the presence and the purpose. Shoot! the boy cried, not bothering to hold his voice down any longer, for the elephant was moving slowly towards the side of the wallow, moving deliberately to firmer footing. And the boy was afraid. Mike was afraid, too. But he couldn't shoot. No, he murmured. Let him go. I can't kill him. You must, the boy said. You promise. Look, all the meat. Meat for two, three villages. Mike shook his head. I can't do it, he said. That isn't meat. That's life bigger life than we are. Don't you understand? Oh, the bloody hell with it. Come on." The boy wasn't listening to him. He was watching the elephant. And now he started to tremble. For the elephant was moving up onto solid ground. It moved slowly, daintily, almost mincing as its legs sampled the surface of the shore. Then it looked up, and this time there was no doubt as to the direction of its gaze. It stared intently at Mike and the boy on the bank. Its ears fanned, then flared. Suddenly the elephant raised its trunk and trumpeted fiercely. And then, lowering the black battering ram of its head, the beast came forward, a deceptively slow lope, a scarcely accelerating trot, and then all at once it was moving swiftly, swiftly and surely and inexorably toward them. The angle of the bank was not steep, and the elephant's speed never slackened on the slope. Its right shoulder struck a sapling and the sapling splintered. It was crashing forward in full charge. Again it trumpeted, trunk extended like a flail of doom. Shoot! the boy screamed. Mike didn't want to shoot. He wanted to run. He wanted to flee the mountain, flee the incredible breathing bulk of this grotesque giant. But he was a white hunter. He was a man. And a man is not a beast. A man does not run away from life in any shape or size. The trunk came up. Mike raised the gun. He heard the monster roar, far away, and then he heard another sound that must be the gun's discharge, and something hit him in the shoulder and knocked him down. Recoil? Yes, because the elephant wasn't there any more. He could hear the crashing and thrashing down below over the rim of the river bank. Mike stood up. He saw the boy running now, running back to the bearers, huddled along the edge of the trail. He rubbed his shoulder, picked up his gun, reloaded. The sounds from below had ceased. Slowly Mike advanced to the lip of the bank and stared down. The bull elephant had fallen and rolled into the wallow once more. It had taken a direct hit just beneath the right ear, and even as Mike watched, its trunk writhed feebly like a dying serpent, then fell forward into the mud. 
The gigantic ears twitched and flicked and flopped, and the huge body rolled and settled. Suddenly Mike began to cry. Damn it! He hadn't wanted to shoot! If the elephant hadn't charged like that! But the elephant had to charge, just as he had to shoot. That was the whole secret, the secret of life, and the secret of death, too. Mike turned away, facing the east. Kenya Roby was east, and he'd be going there now. Nothing to hold him here in the forests any longer. He wouldn't even wait for the big feast. To hell with the elephant meat, anyway. His hunting days were over. Mike walked slowly up the trail to the waiting boys, and behind him, in the wallow, the flies settled down on the lifeless carcass of the last elephant in the world. End of Chapter 7 of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch